Today's video is brought to you by Audible. Hey, brother. All right, guys, so a couple years ago, we made a video all about Mrs. Norris. Like, what is up with this cat? How is she always so on it? And plenty of you at home right now might be like, hey, that's just how cats do. They be on it. But others of you who, let's face it, are being way more realistic are like, man, that cat is weird. Something is going on with the cat, and it's those people I agree with. Nothing like alienating your audience in the first 30 seconds, am I right? <laughs> all right, here we go. No, but all cat humor aside, Mrs. Norris is kind of an odd bird. I mean, she roams the school and almost has some sort of like perfect synchronicity with Filch. She seems to have a pension for rule following and I have it on good authority that she received a gold star for Hall Monitor of the Year. Though to be fair, it was Filch who made the gold star and if I'm being honest, it was more like a stick figure star with a bunch of glitter. It looked like he spilled the glitter. There were clumps of it in places. It was ugh. But there's just a big question mark over this character because she seems to be serving a purpose that goes well beyond the behaviors of a regular cat, which is really not that uncommon in this world. I I mean, Crookshanks is extra sly and intelligent because it turns out he's half measle. Scabbers has lived an unusually long life because it turns out he's actually a snake. <coughs> Traitor, the beetle that keeps showing up around the Triwizard Tournament turns out to be Rita Skeeter. The dog that scares Harry before he gets on the night bus is Sirius. Even the basilisk that occupies the school's basement isn't even just a malicious basilisk. It's a parcel mouth who's receiving orders from Lord Voldemort. And so on. The point is where there's smoke, there's fire. Where there's an unusual animal, there is a weird explanation. So today we re-examine Mrs. Norris. Is she the exception? Is she just an odd cat? Or is she like Nagini? Is she actually a maledictus? Hey, brother! Guys, before we dive on in, we need to give a huge thank you to today's sponsor, Audible. Okay, real talk, I use Audible literally every day of my life, whether it's just driving to work, taking a shower, doing chores around the house, falling asleep at night, which I will say on that last one, pro tip, sometimes people are afraid to listen to a book when they're falling asleep because it'll keep playing after they fall asleep, but Audible has a built-in sleep timer so you can just set it and it'll stop after like 10 or 15 minutes or however long, it's fully customizable. Plus, Audible gives you a credit each month as part of your subscription so you can get any audiobook you want at a tremendously great rate. And once it's downloaded, it's yours to keep forever even if you stop using Audible. You also get full access to their popular Plus catalog. It is filled with thousands and thousands of audiobooks, original entertainment, guided fitness and meditation, sleep tracks for better rest, and podcasts, including ad-free versions of your favorite shows and exclusive series. Audible always likes us to give a book recommendation as well, and this month it is super easy. You know what I'm gonna recommend. It's The Name of the Wind by Patrick Rothfuss. I have already re-listened to it like five times. Plus, the narration is done by Nick Podell, who is an amazing, amazing narrator. So not only is it a good story, but it's a really good listen. Plus it's just like a really well fleshed out fantasy world. And if you're watching this video, I'm guessing that's the sort of thing you're already into. And the best part is if you just want to try it out, you can get 30 days free when you go to audible.com slash super Carlin or text super Carlin to 500 500. Again, that is 30 days free at audible.com slash super Carlin or text super Carlin to 500 500. Link is in the description down below. Okay. So let's start by dating back to our original theory and picking up where we left off. In that video, we discovered that the author states that Mrs. Norris, despite all of her extraordinary abilities, is just a cat. And that's pretty much where we left it. I mean, after all, it's a book about magic where there are trolls and dragons. And are we really gonna split hairs over whether or not a cat is a little extra special? You bet your butt we are. Welcome to the channel. Are all the new people gone yet? Honestly, for the longest time, I had no problem just believing that Mrs. Norris was just an unpleasant cat. But we have been putting one particular magical artifact under the microscope lately, and it has led us to some interesting discoveries. And that artifact is the Marauder's Map. And just like anything else, when we start diving into something like this, we like to try and understand all the rules of how it works. And as we have pieced those rules together, Mrs. Norris is a bit of an outlier. As I'm sure you're already aware, the Marauder's Map is an extremely powerful magical artifact that plots the unplottable Hogwarts and accurately tracks the location and name of every person inside. And considering it was made by four high schoolers, or well, let's face it, three in their rat friend, it is really impressive, particularly the part where it names everyone. Cause like, how? How is it labeling all the dots? When Harry gets it, the map is already a couple of decades old. Like there are people on the map who were not born when the map was written. So where is it getting the names? How do map? How do? Well, 
Our theory is that the map works in accordance with the Book of Admittance and the Quill of Acceptance. That's the reason the map is able to be so powerful and keep up to date with all of the new and incoming students, because it's sourcing all of its information from this book and quill, which thus far have been unfallible. Infallible? Infallible. Also, let's be real, if the Marauders were just regular muggles, they would be awesome at spreadsheets. I can just see Sirius hacking into the Census Bureau like, guys, every time a new name is added, it's going right in our spreadsheet. Ho <laughs> ho Get ready for emails. Classic Padfoot. Totally an email spammer. Anyway, getting a little back on track. When I say the book and quill are infallible, that means that they have so far never let a squib or muggle get accepted into Hogwarts. That's like their whole job. The Quill and Book, if you don't know, log every person in the book that is magical enough to attend Hogwarts after the first time they've done anything magical. Meaning it would be a future-proof, ongoing, comprehensive list of all magical people the map could then source all of its names from. That also means that one of the limits of the map is that it could not track anyone who was not considered magical enough to attend the school. As such, the map wouldn't be able to track squibs or muggles, but that's not much of a limit since neither are really allowed at the school anyway. That said, the group for encouraging squib tolerance at the education place, aka Gestate is still accepting new members and uh, pre-orders on t-shirts. If you want one, there's a link in the description. But for this reason, I think we can safely rule out the possibility that Mrs. Norris is actually a muggle human because muggle humans cannot turn into cats. Also, I don't think many people were under that impression, but it's off the board. That said, as we've also recently discussed here on the channel, there is a hiccup with this particular theory, and that is Mrs. Norris's counterpart, Filch, because Filch is supposedly a squib and yet he appears on the map. How's that work? Well, full video by clicking the card, but short answer is that Filch is a poltergeist and he's basically the exact opposite of Peeves. Peeves is the manifestation of all the rule breaking at the school, whereas Filch is the manifestation of all the rule following. They also happen to be sworn enemies, so that kind of helps. But because these are both magical manifestations that exist in the school and only in the school, that means they are both actually magically part of the school. And as such, it stands to reason that a map of the school would show things that are a part of the school. You see how that works? All this to say, Mrs. Norris shows up on the map and for all intents and purposes, this breaks the rules, which means the current explanation that she is simply a cat is unacceptable. For one, Mrs. Norris is literally the only animal we ever see show up on the map. I mean, I suppose it's possible they are showing up and they just never mention it in the text, but think about what that would mean, like especially at mail time in the Great Hall. <laughs> Or for that matter, how is it that Harry never sees the house elves moving around the castle? Or think about when Ron is missing scabbers. Harry isn't like, oh, wait a minute, let me just go check the map and we'll see where he is. Same goes for when he's watching Crookshanks walk around with that mysterious black dog and they keep disappearing. Oh, if only I had a map that shows where everything is. Oh, oh Harry is so bad at the map. Except that in this case, he's not because animals don't show up on the map. But are you telling me that during Harry's first year when Dumbledore is like, nobody should go to the third floor corridor, that the Weasley twins who have the map at the point, don't immediately open it up and see what's there and see a little dot labeled Fluffy and then go investigate it? Or should it be three dots? Actually, it would be zero because Fluffy doesn't show up on the map because if it did, the Weasleys would go and investigate it. Some things you can just rely on. It would also mean the Weasleys didn't see the Basilisk roaming around the school in the second year. Though I guess to be fair, we never knew the Basilisk's name. Maybe they did see it. What would Salazar have named the Basilisk? Hmm. Fred, you know a kid named Wiggins? He's in the walls! No, how's he doing that? Not gonna lie, we spent three minutes just now in the middle of filming coming up with that joke, which ultimately doesn't matter because animals don't show up on the map. Now granted, maybe we shouldn't be giving Fred and George that much credit because apparently they also never saw Peter Pettigrew sleeping in the same bed as Ron every night for three years. So like, maybe they're not as observant as we think, but actually, we have a really good explanation for why they never saw Peter. Or, well, actually, our buddy Seamus has a really good explanation. You can see Seamus's full video right here and I highly recommend you do because it is a very good solution to this very obvious problem. But the answer is that the Marauders don't show up on the Marauders map except to the other Marauders. That way they could always find each other but could never be found by anyone else if the map happened to fall into the wrong hands. It really is a very clever answer. But look, look, even the first time Harry ever looks at the map, this is what it says. A labeled dot in the left corner showed that Professor Dumbledore was pacing in his study. The caretaker's cat, Mrs. Norris, was prowling the second floor and Peeves the poltergeist was currently bouncing around the trophy room. Like it mentions specifically Mrs. Norris and Dumbledore but not that Fox was 
also in Dumbledore's office? There's just too many cases of animals not being mentioned, but they're not being mentioned because animals don't show up on the map, but Mrs. Norris does. Conclusion, Mrs. Norris is not an animal. But if she's not an animal, then what is she? Well, first let's hop back to our previous argument that Filch is a poltergeist. Well, if Filch is a poltergeist and Mrs. Norris isn't an animal, then is it possible that actually these two are more of one and the same and that's why they work so well together because they're part of the same manifestation? Because sometimes it feels like that could be the case. Like Mrs. Norris will find someone and like minutes later, Filch will come running. Like how was that working? But no, I don't think so. Because for one, they appear as two completely separate entities on the map. And two, because very specifically, Mrs. Norris is the first victim of the Basilisk in Chamber of Secrets. Who again, was probably named Wiggins. To which you might be saying, well, wait, if she was a poltergeist, wouldn't she not be affected by the basilisk? But actually I'm pretty sure that wouldn't stop the basilisk from harming her. I mean, after all, nearly headless Nick is a ghost and he's already dead and he gets petrified. Sort of. My real point is that if Mrs. Norris and Filch were part of the same manifestation, then when she was petrified, so should have he then been. Moving on though, our next explanation was that could Mrs. Norris be an animagus? Just one who decided she'd rather permanently stay as a cat? This is not technically an impossible explanation, but it also doesn't feel like a very good one. For one, there are only seven registered animagus in the 20th century, and one of them is Professor McGonagall, who's also a cat. Though to be fair, we know there are more than seven because at least James, Sirius, and Rita Skeeter were all animagus outside the law. But I have a feeling Dumbledore would know this information and wouldn't be hired into the school without being registered. But what makes it more unbelievable is that becoming an Animagus is hard. Like, really hard. So difficult we actually made an entire video about how to do it, but rest assured, if you can do it, it's pretty unlikely that you're using your abilities to be a hall monitor at a high school. And hey, I hear what you're saying. Don't underestimate the importance of safety. Someone might want to dedicate their life to that kind of work. Someone's gotta be out there making sure you actually have a bathroom pass. But why would someone who can turn back into a witch and cares that much about hall safety then rely on the very non-magical Argus Filch to actually do all of the enforcing. Plus, just like take this line from the Battle of Hogwarts in Deathly Hallows. Along it another corridor he dashed, and then there were owls everywhere, and Mrs. Norris was hissing and trying to bat them with their paws, no doubt to return them to their proper place. Mrs. Norris is swatting at owls during an actual battle. I'm gonna go ahead and say she wasn't the safety first kind of human slash permanent cat. So that leaves us with a final question. How could an animal show up on the map, not be a physical part of the school, and not be an animagus? I mean, this isn't like a grand reveal or anything, it's literally the title of the video, but the only real possibility left is that she must be a maledictus. A maledictus, in case you need a refresher, is a blood curse that destines someone to permanently become a particular animal. The greatest, and otherwise only other known example, unless you count Luna, which we do, is Nagini, who it was revealed in The Crimes of Grim Grindelwald used to be a human woman. It's worth noting that this is distinctly different from a werewolf, which is a different kind of non-voluntary transformation, or an animagus, which is a voluntary and intentional kind of transformation. Although that said, in Crimes of Grindelwald, Nagini can change between forms. The difference is that she didn't opt to become an animagus in the first place, and eventually she will permanently change into a snake non-voluntarily. The big question that remains unanswered so far though is once the permanent transformation happens, do you just become that animal or are you like a human trapped in that animal's body? And really this could kind of go either way. I mean, on the one hand, in the case of Nagini, if she is a human trapped in a snake's body, then we still need to see a lot of things happen to get from this innocent looking young woman to the right hand snack of Big Baldy. On the flip side though, Tom Riddle is a parcel mouth who can control snakes and the basilisk. So maybe she just turns into a regular snake and then is responding to Voldemort's commands. If the latter is the case and Mrs. Norris is just a cat, then it's actually kind of hilarious because we're right back at the same conclusion we initially ruled out that Mrs. Norris is just a cat. With the important distinction, however, that before that, she was a witch. And as a witch, her name was written in the Book of Admittance and therefore she can and still does show up on the Marauder's map. But her otherwise lack of human thinking causes her to swat at owls during literal wartime instead of something useful like biting ankles or something. Which let's be real, feels like the kind of thing she would have done anyway. Maybe to the students though. Hmm. The other option is that she can still think and act like a human, but is just forever stuck 
as a cat. And if that's the case, I like to think that her previous job was doing literally exactly what she is still doing today. Because keeping her on board to roam the schools feels like exactly the sort of thing Dumbledore would do. I mean, after all, someone's got to keep them owls in line. But guys, what do you think? Is Mrs. Norris a maledictus? Let us know your thoughts in the towel section down below. Also, it is not too late to join the group for the encouragement of squib tolerance at the education place. We have shirts available for pre-order right now. Link is in the description down below. But guys, thanks as always for watching today's video. Don't forget to leave a like on it if you haven't already and subscribe so you don't miss any future Harry Potter action from us. If you want to see how Fred and George figured out how to work the Marauders map, you can check out this video right here. But Ben, until next time, I will see you in another life, brother.